This week's topic is ownership of copyrights. We're going to distinguish between authorship and ownership because technically it's not the same thing. We did learn on that a author, once their work is placed in a tangible form, would become the owner. That's when copyright attaches. But that's not... While that is the case, what happens next uh, could determine who actually owns that work, whether it stays with the one who created it or someone or something else now owns it. And I'm going to start with uh, a rather recent case involving the uh, internet, websites, blogs, Zillow. If you're not familiar with Zillow, it's a... uh, platform for folks to use, and I'm just generally uh, speaking, uh, to sell their homes. Usually they don't have a real estate agent and they use the Zillow platform to put their house and home out there for sale, right? If you go to Zillow and you type in Plattsburgh, New York, or wherever you're interested in moving, you can see houses that are for sale uh, by the owner. Sometimes it's a little outdated and sometimes the houses aren't even for sale. I don't know how that really works out, but that's the gist of Zillow. And then we have a woman, Kate Wagner, who operates a uh, blog, Tumblr uh, blog called McMansion Hell. And she basically criticizes the uh, architectural uh, status of the real estate Uh, homes based on the photos that are on Zillow and she will link the photos to her blog when she makes her criticism and Zillow sent her a letter one of those shakedown letters those cease and desist letters saying you're infringing on copyrights you need to take those photos down And of course, Miss Wagner really got freaked out, and she did. She did pull down her blog entirely, and then she was asking, then she sought legal counsel or asking if she can continue with her blog, because that was the gist of her blog, was to um, criticize and critique these uh, homes. And lo and behold, Zillow was way off base with doing that, Why might you think, based on the information that I just shared, if Zillow is a platform for individuals to sell their homes, who's posting the photos? The homeowners? Zillow has nothing to do with the photos. They didn't take the photos. They don't put the photos up. They allow them to be there. But they don't own the photos, which means they have no ownership rights, which means they have no copyright in the photo. Uh, So that crushed uh, Zillow's attempt at shakedown is really what it was. I don't think they like the idea of being criticized, which is a First Amendment right, which when we get to fair use, we will talk about the fact, even if Zulu owned those photos, what Miss Wagner was doing uh, was First Amendment speech of opinion and uh, criticizing a particular work. But we'll talk more about that when we get to uh, fair use. But ownership, you have to actually own it, the work, in order to have a copyright in it. So who owns works? Some further examples. We'll just talk about copywriters at an ad agency. Right, They're creating copy. They're designing ads, whether they're for TV or print. Do they own those copyrights? No, they don't. Who would own those? You might say the ad agency they worked for. What about the client who paid for it? It's going to depend on the agreement between the agency and the client, but most likely the client will own that, despite the fact that the authorship came from the copywriters. 
if there are several parties involved in creating a work, the question becomes, well, which one owns it? Generally, these days, there's parties need and usually do have some sort of written agreement. But in the absence of an agreement, we know that copyright subsists from the first time the work is fixed in a tangible medium. So the author initially owns it. And as the author, that author has the right to transfer any of the rights or grant licenses to allow others to exercise those rights. So to determine ownership of a copyright, we need to determine two things. Who is the author or authors? This is our initially, who initially owns this copyright? And then number two, has ownership of the copyright been transferred to somebody else? That comes later in our semester. We are going to be dealing with question one. And let me give you an example of folks who have serious problems with ownership. Rock bands. Uh, rock bands get started. They get together and, you know, one of their one who has a garage or a family garage where they can practice and write their music and create together. And when they become famous and their songs are on the radio and they want, uh, they're being recorded and they're performing them and then fights ensue over who owns what, who did what. There's five members of there was five members of Guns N' Roses. They had, they'd been in and out of court relative to ownership of music when the lead singer Axel Rose decided that he was going to be the kingpin of licensing the songs and the uh, other folks, uh, the other members of the band were upset saying that you know, we get a say in this too. And these are all things that we are gonna discuss, but it does arise often with rock bands and there are rock bands who have ironclad agreements uh kiss is one of those bands paul stanley and gene simmons are the kingpins and have all of the rights to their music uh, john bon jovi and richie sambora uh, those two have uh writing uh songwriter uh credits not the entire band of Bon Jovi, John Lennon and Paul McCartney were the you know writers for the Beatles and um, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards for the Rolling Stones, and I can go on and on. But they need agreements. Otherwise, you run into uh, issues with regards to ownership. Aerosmith has run amok with the uh, who owns the song, and does it matter how much who contributes oh i you know i i played the riff i got the riff in that but is the riff the most most powerful one anyway i digress so ownership of copyright it has important consequences the parties in these situations should make agreements but if they don't how the statue says who owns what ownership of copyright unless there's an agreement otherwise these are the rules uh, a, copyright in a work vests in the initial owner or joint authors share equally if there's no other rule. So if you're in a rock band and there's five of you and there's no agreement, they all share equally. Works for made for hire. This is the employer or the one whom the work was prepared is considered the owner. And there's some big questions on what constitute a work made for hire. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And contributions to collective works. The copyright in each separate contribution to a collective work is distinct from the copyright as the whole and vests with the author of that contribution. So collection of poems, copyright is with that poem. The collective work as a whole is a copyright to whoever owns the contribution. The owner of the copyright in the collective work is presumed to have acquired only the privilege of reproducing and distributing the contribution as part of the uh, particular collective work. They don't then get the poem. So when a work is created, one of the 
one of these above situations will apply. So what do you think might be a typical dispute that comes up? What might you think is a typical dispute that comes up? Well, for one, the hiring party versus the hired creator. That's a typical dispute. Was the work made for hire? What about the primary author versus a contributor or a co-author? These are the types of disputes and questions that come up relative to authorship and ownership. And let's talk about individual individuals first. The statute doesn't define author. Uh, usually there is no question, though, as to who can claim authorship. Generally speaking, the author is a person, uh, the author of a work is the person who actually creates the work. That is the person who translates an idea into a fixed, tangible expression uh, that's entitled to the copyright protection. That came from a Supreme Court case that we are going to explore in more detail in a minute. Uh, but that's what the Supreme Court ruled in 1989. So um, generally speaking, the author of a work is the person who actually creates the work that is the person who translates the idea into a fixed, tangible expression, and they're the ones who are entitled to the copyright protection, right? So poet writes a poem, they own the copyright. Where more than one person produces the work, a single person may nevertheless be deemed the author of the work, even if he did not actually perform any of the hands-on labor in fixing the work. Whoa, that's a big one. More than one person is claiming to be, well, I want to say that again. Where more than one person produces a work, like a single person may nevertheless still be deemed the author of the work, even if that person didn't actually perform any of the work or the hands-on labor in fixing the work. We're going to talk about a case in a minute. If more than one person claims to be an author, the courts are going to look at a few things. Uh, they're going to look at who initiated the work, who contributed original creative expression, who controlled the work, whom the parties considered to be the author and whom third parties believed to be the author. So there's six things. Who initiated the work? Who contributed original creative expression? Who controlled the work? Whom the parties considered to be the author and whom the third parties believe to be the author. So let's talk about Lindsay versus... Actually, I should should change that name. That's one of the, the defendants, but it's Lindsay versus the Titanic. I, I like that. Uh, the wrecked and abandoned vessel, it's the Titanic. So I'm going to give you some background on this particular case. It might be a little lengthy, but you need to get the, the point relative to the, to the facts. So you see where I'm going with it. All right. Lindsay... is a independent documentary filmmaker and he's in the business of in creating and filming documentaries the defendant is a whole slew of defendants but the primary defendant is rms titanic inc okay and in 1993 uh well just for short for this lecture i'll call it titanic inc uh, was awarded exclusive status um, as Selver in possession of the Titanic wreck site and is therefore authorized to carry on sal uh, salvage operations at the um, ship's wreck site. As a condition of obtaining those rights, however, they've agreed to maintain all the artifacts it recovered during the salvage operations for historical verification, scientific education, and public awareness so that's what they do when they go out and collect artifacts from where the titanic sank 
1994, Lindsay, our plaintiff, under contract with a British television company film and directed a film called Explorers of the Titanic. And this, um, and this was the third time that the Titanic Inc. went out to the site to uh, collect artifacts. And Lindsay filmed the documentary, went out to the wreck site, spent a month there, and created this film. Okay? Later, so that's, film is, film is done. And there was, uh, during that time, oh, this is an important point, that during that time, after filming that documentary portion, he conceived a new film project uh, for the Titanic wreck using illumination lighting equipment. So, after that's over, the plaintiff discusses with um, the defendant that uh, they agreed to work on a venture for 1995 and in that year, Lindsay traveled to New York to develop a business plan for this new film project. They were calling it Titanic, a memorial tribute. The defendant informed, claimed that he informed the plaintiff that they would agree to this plan, which would include provisions for compensating the plaintiff for his work on the project. and that they would need approval from the board members. Well, on that discussion, the plaintiff agreed to join Titanic Inc. to raise money not only for the film project, but for other aspects of their uh, operation. The plaintiff moved into an office at Titanic Inc. and it, that's around 1995, middle, uh, April 1995. Around this time, the defendants can, repeatedly told the plaintiff that he would obtain approval from the board of directors for a contract for the plaintiff based on terms that were already discussed for the film. Uh, and the contract was to conclude, include the terms of compensation, sharing of the profits, profits derived from any film, video, you know, photographs that were uh, obtained. But guess what? Contract never happened. But work continued. As part of pre-production efforts, the plaintiff created various storyboards for the film, uh, a series of drawings which incorporated the images of the Titanic uh, by identifying specific camera angles and shooting sequences that reflected plaintiff's creative inspiration and force behind the, the concept. Um, concept for shooting. The plaintiff also alleged that uh, they also claim that uh, along with the members of his film team, they designed a huge underwater light towers that were later used to make the film. Uh, Lindsay also personalized, constructed, personally constructed the light towers and thereafter for about three to four weeks, directed, produced, and acted as this, uh, uh, acted as the uh, individual creating the, the cinema uh, filming for the subject work. He did the underwater, he reviewed the underwater videotaping for the Titanic uh, wreck and they, they sent, he sent uh, the video cameras down and he otherwise participated in that 1996 uh, trip out to um, savage further uh, artifacts. He also directed the film, filming of the wreck site from the board, uh, from the board of the vessel. Uh, he did daily planning sessions. The submarine used to transport the film equipment and photographers to the underwater wreck, uh, wreck site. He was in charge of organizing. Uh, the purpose of the sessions was to provide the photographers with detailed instructions for positioning and utilizing light towers. Okay. That's a lot of the facts, but you need to know them to determine who owns now this, this film project that was created. Um, Titanic Inc. says it's theirs. Lindsay says it's his. And based on those facts, what do you, what do you think? He moved into their office. He began preparations for the film. There was no agreement putting anything in writing. What are you thinking so far? 
according to this court in New York, by the way, this is New York federal court. The, um, well, I'm going to tell you what Titanic said. The Titanic Inc. said that, um, guess what? The plaintiff doesn't own anything because he never did, he, because he did not dive down to the ship and therefore he himself was not actually photographing the wreck. How do you feel about that? We had that case, one of our first cases about subject matter with the camera where the court in that very old case, uh, the photograph of the actor where the court said, said what? That's okay, because it's the, you still own the copyright photographer. You did all of this setting up and the lighting and establishing. Yeah, actually took the picture, but that wasn't the, the uh, facts that led a court to believe that a photographer owns a copyright in their photograph. It was what goes into that photograph. And the court is kind of funny, and I'm going to quote him. Uh, the court says about the defendant's argument, this argument does not hold water. I kind of think that's funny since that's what we're talking about, the lake or on the, the ocean, I mean. But the court went on to say copyright ownership vests initially in the author or the authors of the work. And then goes on to cite that very old case uh, about what Mr. Lindsay uh, has done. He set up the lighting. He sent the cameras down. He directed how it was going to be done. So that argument failed to the defendants. And then they argued Another point of, well, then we own it together. Then we own it together. He doesn't own, own it outright. We're joint authors. And the argument for that was um, there was an individual, Mr. Patron, who was hired as the main photographer of the film. He was hired to actually shoot the film under a work for hire agreement. There was actually an agreement between that individual and Titanic Inc. that they, this person would be the photographer to do the filming. And the court said, so they're joint. So because of that work for hire relationship, Titanic Inc. owns that work that patron had, was shooting. And the court said, no, that's not going to work either because Mr. Lindsay was the one in charge. Lindsay plans in detail how the filming is going to go. Um, he's the one that actually put together all the storyboards. He was the one who was making all of the decisions, and that particular photographer had to follow those directions. He had the quote-unquote veto authority to say, no, that's not going to go in. He had total control total control. So based on everything that I've said, where do you think the court fell relative to ownership? Mr. Lindsay, the person who exercises the control and artistic decision making is the author, regardless who is who did the actual fix, fixation. And this is outside of an agreement otherwise. So while the plan was for them to have some sort of agreement. The agreement never came to light. So the court ruled that the creator, the author, is the one that owns, owns the work. So you can see where these things get sticky, especially, you know, if you're hired as uh, someone to shoot video, someone to create audio for somebody else's project. Uh, we're going to talk more of whether that's considered a work for hire or something else. But just to kind of reiterate my points here, this is what the court's going to look at to determine ownership when we're dealing with an individual work. Who initiated the work? Who contributed the original creative expression? Who controlled the work? Whom the parties considered to be the author? Whom third parties believe to be the author? So those are the factors that the court is going to review. And I thought I had one more slide here before I got to Miss Chloe Kardashian. Um, 
but I'll do, I'll, I'll talk about this case <laughs> right now. All right. Chloe Kardashian, because she is a Kardashian, feels as though she can do whatever she would like to do. And what she did was she took this photo that she found on the internet and posted it on her Instagram page. And she's got millions of followers on the Instagram page. And as you can see, it's a little highlighted on the uh, kind of zoomed in where you can actually see the watermark. This is actually from her Instagram page where she just posts the picture with the watermark right on it, uh, you know, establishing that it's somebody else's photograph. So I will give you a general uh, example. And we'll tie it into, uh, Chloe. I thought it was Chloe. Yeah, it is Chloe, not Courtney. It's Chloe. All right. So paparazzi, self-employed photographer, lingers outside the entrance of celebrity's apartment building. When celebrity emerges, paparazzi takes a photo of celebrity walking by a garbage can. When paparazzi seeks to license the photo to various tabloids, celebrity claims there's a copyright in the photo. Celebrity argues that the photo has value only because of her hard work in establishing her fame and therefore the right to exploit that fame belongs to the celebrity. And the question is who owns the copyright in the photo? I mean, certainly Chloe would have a good point, right? Otherwise, you know, what kind of value is in that photo? But who owns the copyright in the photo? The author, the one who created it, right? The paparazzi owns the copyright in the photo. Celebrity, celebrity may have done all the work to establish the public interest in celebrity, but the copyrighted work at issue is simply the photograph with its image of the celebrity. So paparazzi is clearly the author of the photo. And remember, in deciding authorship, courts are going to consider those factors who initiated the work, who contributes the creative expression, who controls the creation of the work, who makes the creative decisions, who third parties would consider the author, all of those things, all those factors weigh toward the paparazzi. And certainly there's no joint work here because Chloe has not contributed anything to the creation of that photo. But paparazzi's copyright does not give him unlimited rights to use the photo, as you remember from one of our earlier topics. It only confers with him the exclusive rights as a copywriter, copyright owner to the photo. But as you know, certain commercial uses of the photo would make the paparazzi liable under right of publicity, right? Right of publicity laws. But, you know, selling it to a newspaper or a rag magazine for publication, oh, look, Chloe's going out to dinner tonight or whatever it was that was going on with this photo. Um, is not the type of commercial activity, even though he's making money, that gives rise to publicity laws. Now, if he used that photo or sold that photo to somebody else to use in a uh, commercial or an ad for a product, well, then now we have a problem with uh, publicity law, but that would be more on the person who is now using it to uh, promote the product, not necessarily the photographer. So you got to keep all of those things in mind. They all play a role, kind of all tied together. So the question is, do authors need to be, I, my next question, do the authors need to be identified? No, they don't. If, well, then you might be saying, well, how do we know who owns it? Well, if you aren't the creator of the work, you're not going to be the, the owner. Um, and you can't take somebody else's work just because it doesn't have a name on it and claim it as ownership or as yours. And the statue actually contemplates such works because there are works that have, you know, people create without identifying it or putting their name on it. Or there are authors who work under different names. Stephen King works off a, uh, a different name in writing in writing books and he actually got away with it for, and I can't remember the name of it but if you, you google it it'll come up because he actually wrote a number of works under a different name before he was like called out on it it's a big Stephen King fan was like yeah this 
this author is definitely Stephen King, and he got called out on it. Uh, Prince was a big, um, you all know who Prince was, right? Music, the musician, he's an excellent songwriter, passed away a few years ago. Um, he liked to write songs for other people under a different name. His different name was Christopher Nevermind, but he still owned the rights. So my exercises was the Khloe Kardashian. I just had these slides a little out of, out of order. Uh, but let's move on to works made for hire. We have uh, a couple different uh, works made for hire. Just because a party pays for a work does not mean he or she owns the copyright. Uh, we have works that are made by employees. Those are the obvious, obvious ones, right? If you work at a, um, a magazine or a newspaper, you're a you know, journalist, any content you create is going to be owned by the newspaper. If, uh, you know, record labels own the sound recordings and uh, the record contracts between the bands and the artists have language that their works for hires. The, those folks don't have any rights in the, uh, the sound recordings. And then there's works that are ordered uh, and commissioned. Another term for that is independent contractors, freelancers. Remember those produce, hire those folks who maybe you're hiring a, a camera person to help in your documentary. You want to make sure you get the appropriate language in there. Um, I want to start with talking about works by uh, employees. I'm going to start with a case involving, I think next slide. Yep, here we go. All right. Some examples of uh, works by uh, additional works by employees, technical writers for software companies, right? I've already talked about the ad agency. I've talked about the reporters and the record labels. I just want to make sure you have all sorts of examples before I move on to this case and we expand on it. Uh, community for Creative Nonviolence versus Reed. I cited this case a few slides ago. This is a Supreme Court case. Um, and it turns on whether someone is an employee or an independent contractor. And it's not that clear in some circumstances. Look at that Lindsay case. The, you, that really turned on whether or not Lindsay was just hired by Titanic Inc. to do this film or whether he was some other as an employee or was he some independent contractor with the requirement that Titanic Inc. would own the work, like that photographer in the case. They actually had a work for hire agreement, but they never had an agreement. What happens when you don't have agreement? You run into issues like the one we are going to talk about. In this particular case, a not-for-profit organization hired a sculpture to create a sculpture of a homeless family. This is the sculpture that you see right here. After it was completed, the parties disputed over the ownership of the copyright in it. Um, let me give you some more background facts. That was the general, the general gist. But the plaintiff, who is Community for Creative Nonviolence, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advocacy for the cause of homelessness in the United States. It negotiated with Reed, who is a sculptor, to create a variation of a classic nativity scene depicting homeless persons. Uh, the agreement was reached and the defendant made the sculpture out of the bronze-like material. The defendant worked in his studio at home, worked in his own studio with little direction from the plaintiff Following the unveiling, the defendant registered a copyright in the work, the sculpture. Subsequent to this, a disagreement arose between the two parties who had taken, uh, between the two parties and the defendant took custody of the sculpture. Over, uh, the issue was over future expedition of this sculpture. Plaintiff filed an action seeking to obtain, obtain possession of the work and 
what ensued was the lower court said that the plaintiff owns it. The appeals federal court said, uh, no, plaintiff doesn't, the defendant does, and now it goes to the Supreme Court. And the question was, does one who create one who creates an artwork at the directive of another retain copyright upon it unless that other had employed the artist? So does one who creates an, an artwork at the direction of another retain copyright upon it unless that other had employed the artist? So the court said this is a classic example of common law employment uh, dispute. Whether or not somebody is an independent contractor has to rule under common law agency pr principles. One who creates an artwork at the directive an of another does retain copyright upon it unless that other had employed, employed the artist. So, the Supreme Court held that the classification of a hired party follows these factors. The hiring party, hiring party's right to control, the manner, well, yeah, I do have it on it. I thought I did. So these are the things that you look for to determine whether somebody is hired or is an independent contractor. The top one is the, is the, is the, Big, is the big one that they look at the most, but the hiring party's right to control the manner and means by which the product is accomplished. And in this case, he worked from home or his own studio with little direction, right? The source of tools or instrumentalities used. He used his own. The location of work. Was it at home or was it at their office? It was at his own, his own office. What was the duration of the relationship between the parties? It was just to make this one creative work. There was no ongoing relationship. Whether the hiring party has the right to assign additional proje uh, projects to the hired party. And the answer is no. They had one agreement to do this one project. To the extent the hired party's discretion over when and how long to work. Nope. There was no hours set forth. There was no this is what you have to do. The method of payment is considered. This is a one time finish your work, get paid. The hired party's role in hiring and paying assistance? No, that was all in the control of Reed. If he needed it, he didn't in this case. Whether the work is part of the regular business of the hiring party? Uh, no, they're in the business as a nonprofit organization. Whether the hiring party is in the sculpturing business? It's not. The provisions of employee benefits? There wasn't any for this individual one contract and was there any tax treatment of the hired party no he's just paid the tax that gets worked out on his own he, he was a sculptor the sculptor he was an independent contractor he had a skilled occupation his own studio his own tools no supervision by the organization and he had complete freedom to create it so in this instance Community for Creative Nonviolence lost and does not own a copyright in that work. And hence, the sculptor can do whatever he wants with it. So, moral of the story. Not everything an employee creates is a work, work for hire, but the moral of the story is to get, get an agreement. If somebody's not, if it's not obvious, you don't work for Apple creating software. You don't work at, you know, a publishing company or a, a sorry, a newspaper. And you're a journalist. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about works made for hire, though. Okay. Not everything an employee creates is a work made for hire. The work must also be created within the scope of the employment, okay? If you work at Apple between the hours of 9 and 5 creating software, anything you, you create at Apple for software is going to be owned by Apple. 
but a police officer who paints on his own free time, right, owns a copyright in the painting, not the police department. Or you like to write, let's say you work for a uh, newspaper, you're a journalist, you write articles, but on your free time or on your lunch break or on your regular breaks, you sit in the break room and you got a little journal and you write songs. Does the newspaper own your songs? No. That's your work on your own free time. But a writer who writes an article at home outside of office hours may nevertheless be creating a work for hire if he's writing on a topic within his job description. So you work for a newspaper and you take your work home for you, well, home with you, and you create, that doesn't take it outside the scope. Work must be created within the scope of employment. So the test is whether the work is a type that the employee is employed to perform, whether the work occurs substantially within authorized work hours, and whether its purpose is to serve the employer. So you want to be able to distinguish between, I had a few more of those up there, sorry about that. So you got all of the, in the, you want to, when you're dealing with somebody who is hired to work for somebody, ask, are they an independent contractor? Then all of those factors that are listed here are on, you have to be dealt with and looked at. And you should, and if the goal is to own the copyright, there has to be an agreement that this person is a work made for hire. Otherwise, the independent contractor is going to own it. Okay. Now, number two, to determine work made for hire, the test is whether the work is a type that the employee is employed to perform, whether the work occurs substantially within authorized work hours, whether its purpose is to serve the employer. Have to distinguish between the two, a work made for hire and an independent contractor. Is everything an employee? I guess I'm one slide behind. Sorry, guys. Is everything an employee creates uh, a work made for hire? I just went through this. Here is the test. Now you have it in, in writing. And put, you can put that uh, in your notes. And now I want to talk about this one last photo. This is a very, maybe, maybe you have seen it. This is a very popular photo. It was one of the most retweeted photos, 2014. I know I'm getting a little old on this photo, but I love this photo and it, it sends my point home uh, that we just talked about. This is the 2014 Oscars, uh, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences is the you know, creator of the Oscars. They, have, they control the, the Oscars. Uh, Ellen was hired by the Academy to host the Oscars. One of the sponsors was Samsung, and Samsung gave everybody in the audience a Samsung smartphone. It was their new smartphone that was coming out. Everyone was pretty pumped about that. And during one of the commercial breaks, Ellen says, I got this great idea, let's do a group selfie. And of course, everybody wants to get in on that. Look who's in this picture. Brad Pitt, Bradley Cooper, Jennifer Lawrence, Julia Roberts. Kevin Spacey, a whole bunch of people in here. Um, so Ellen has this great idea to do a group selfie, but there's so many people in it and her arm is too short. So Bradley Cooper grabs the camera out of Ellen's hand and takes a picture. And Ellen is the first one to tweet it. Who owns this photo? Who do you think owns this photo? Is it the Samsung? Is it the Academy? Is it Ellen? Is it Bradley? And usually when I'm in a classroom, there's all sorts of answers. Uh, I'm going to work backwards. It is not the Academy, despite the ones that they are putting on the show. Helen's job was just is to be the, the host, so anything... It's got to be within the scope of her employment. Samsung gave him the phones. So it's not Samsung who's going to 
own this because once they gave the phones away, the phones are now owned by the individual people who have them. Uh, so the question is, is it Ellen or is it Bradley? Well, what did we talk about? The one who creates the work, who created the work? Bradley did when he took the picture, but it's on Ellen's phone. Well, it doesn't matter. Bradley is technically the owner of this photo. And I'm not saying it was a big, hotly contested issue. Bradley doesn't seem to care, didn't care. What was happening is like People Magazine wanted to put it in their magazine and they were trying to do the right thing and try and get permission. And they all went you know, to Ellen because she's the one who tweeted it and it was on her phone. But for copyright purposes, technically the owner is Bradley Cooper. So that finishes uh, our works made for hire and our independent contractors. We still have a few more uh, topics in ownership to discuss that we'll get to next.